This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast. Chris Graham and Scott German. We're going to talk UVA football. Looking back at the season opening 42-13 win for the Hoos over the Richmond Spiders. And I wasn't there. Uh, Scott was. I got to watch the game one replay on Sunday. So we're both talking from some knowledge. And uh, Scott, so first impressions, Scott. Your first impressions uh, of Virginia in that big win uh, you know, scoring a lot of points, playing good defense, etc. Richmond not as good as maybe you know we, we've seen in past years, but overall, your, your impressions. I, I, I think it, uh, we talked, or maybe corresponded, text that tempered enthusiasm. Um, you know, you don't. It's not hard to to find a lot of positives, and you have to really look. To find the positives, all you have to do is think back two years ago when we opened the season, uh, getting humiliated by Richmond, 37 20. So the fact that we came away with a win uh, has to be the, the overriding take, take away is that Virginia won the football game. Um, but beyond that, I, I, I saw some good things. I, I could see a little more depth there. Uh, the offensive line, I think I wrote it in the blog, um, it looks like uh, an NFL offensive line compared to what we saw in the season in the military ball. Um, I think there's more depth for, for, for Mendenhall there. Um, and Perkin is every bit um, is advertised. He's fast. Uh, his acceleration when he's in the field is amazing. Um, so... I'm, 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 uh, you know, cautiously optimistic that that uh, this is going to end up being a good season for us. Now, having said all that, I think we do have to take into consideration that this is not the quality of a football team that what Richmond usually has. This is, uh, this is a much weaker team, so we'll find out. We'll have to wait long until. You know, we really start finding out about this team because Indiana is a huge step up of Richmond. Uh, Indiana going well. We'll talk more about Indiana later in the week, but they are a six and a half point favorite early line uh, uh, this weekend over Virginia. The game's at Indiana, so that's at least part of that is uh, uh, the home uh, home field advantage. But getting back to Richmond, I guess my impressions were, yeah, you know, we knew this Richmond team was picked seventh in the preseason in the CAA. They're not the Richmond team of a couple years ago, even last year. A lot of changes uh, in that Richmond program, new quarterback, etc. But um, that aside, you know, most most uh, FBS teams play a weak opponent in week one. There were a few marquee matchups, but most teams play a, a lighter schedule in the, in the first week to, you know, get their feet under them. We, they don't, you know, nobody has a preseason in, in college football uh, in terms of preseason games, that is. So, uh, you know, you want to work your way in. And what I was most impressed with out of this effort was, well, one, you know, the last two seasons, Virginia started with an FCS team. They lost to Richmond in 2016, as we well documented last week. Last year, uh, a relatively insignificant win over a women Mary team. You know, that game was 28-13 final, the close game going into the fourth quarter. And, and this game was over early, even with the pick six thrown uh, on Virginia's opening possession by Bryce Perkins. He came, comes right back, scores a touchdown 20 seconds later. Uh, it was 14-10 at the end of one period, 28-10 at the half. Uh, game was out of doubt by the halftime, really, as far as how Virginia played. And then, you know, then from the play-calling perspective, really impressed with what we expected, but even more uh, in, in, in the, what we saw, I expected that Bryce Perkins – would give Robert Anae a lot more options at quarterback. Nothing against at all a Kurt Binkert, uh, you know, who's competing for a job in the NFL. He was a roster cut uh, on Saturday by the Atlanta Falcons. I project, I assume he'll be a a, a uh, practice squad guy. But Binkert, even with his NFL talent, just wasn't perfect for the offense. And what we saw out of Perkins that most impressed me, Scott, I got to, I had the advantage of being able to watch a lot of replays since I watched the game one replay. I could you know, rewind back and watch plays over and over. Uh, you know, one, just the litany of plays that Virginia now can run with Perkins at quarterback. I mean, the read options, one, the triple option is another, you know, with, with that traditional wishbone kind of play, uh, you know, the, uh, 
Uh, Wildcat, you know, they ran several plays, straight Wildcat plays for Perkins. Snap to him, and he's a running back. He wasn't even looking to pass. The run-pass option plays where – he had the deci- he had the decision at the line of scrimmage to either throw the ball or run it, uh, and his receivers were in in the formation doing what they needed to do. There's so many more things to this Virginia offense, Scott. I've not seen a wide open playbook like this for a Virginia offense. Really, I wrote this in a column dating back to the George Welch, Tom O'Brien uh, days when they had Sean Moore at quarterback. That's a lofty lofty comparison, but you know, from one game, and of course, you know, there's a lot more to go. But it just seems to me this offense is now so wide open. You know, if I'm Indiana, if I'm Ohio, if I'm ACC teams having to play, prepare for this Virginia team, there's a lot to prepare for that they didn't have to prepare for in the past. And I think that's what most impresses me about what Bryce Perkins brings to this Virginia team. Oh, I agree 100%. And, and you know, here's what you kind of – I guess we, we – we, Somewhat have an advantage of having to be able to get behind the curtain, so to speak. Um, you know, so we, we we discussed that Beckert is a you know fine arm. Um, he's competing. I don't know what his ultimate status was on uh, the Falcons, but he was competing for a, a third string job there. Um, what what? What is different? Why would be? Why would Perkins all of a sudden be such a more a valuable uh, tool than Bickert? And why would Bickert even have been, you know, wanted by UVA? And you know, talking to other media members and asking that question, it was pretty simple. When Bronco came here and, and, and came on board in late December or mid December. Uh, of 2015, um, or 2016, I guess it was, right? Yeah. Um, it, it was clear that Matt Johns was not the quarterback that, that Bronco wanted. And he took what was available because you don't get a lot of players. You get a lot to recruit. It's tough even getting transfers uh, in December. So he basically took what was available, and Binker was a good option. He had a great arm, but Binker still wasn't what this offensive, uh, what what Mendenhall and, uh, and Robert and A wants this offense to look like. And Perkins brings that. Perkins is that that tool and that instrument that that, that you can see now. Now things kind of make sense a little bit. Now now I wasn't second guessing some of the play calling. The playbook looks like it's wide open. Um, you know, it's just this is the offense that Mendenhall wants to run, and now he's starting to get some pieces there. So there's a lot of reason for encouragement. Now, hopefully, we don't take a step back next week, but if we do, I still don't think that's a reason to that we need to start, you know, panicking and throwing deck chairs off the Titanic. Doesn't mean that that we're getting ready to go under again. I think it just shows that where the program is, where the where the, where the process has been. And one other thing I was very impressed, I, I really listened to the press conference, went to the press conference, and you alluded to Bryce, uh, the Perkins going the early pick six. And I mean, up in the press box, it, you could have heard a dime drop on the floor. Um, it was like, here we go again. But they responded, and Mendenhall's comment to that, I thought, was absolutely perfect. And he said the mentality of the team was, no, this is not acceptable. That's not going to happen again. It wasn't, oh, no, the sky is falling. Here we go again. It was like, no, this is not Virginia football. This is not who we are, and this is going to be corrected for the next series. And it was. And I think that was – very encouraging. Yeah, and, and I'll say, too, uh, in, in that sequence, so the pick six is thrown. Virginia driving on its first drive, I mean, driving into Richmond territory, and it was a bad interception. I mean, it's not, you know, sometimes an interception gets returned, and we've seen it before where a ball gets tipped in the air and that kind of thing. I mean, that was a bad interception. You know, we'll throw that one on Bryce, and he'll learn from it. I'm sure he's already learned from it. Uh, but, yeah, the response was, was great. 
Uh, and also, I mean, there was a smart little play in between. I didn't catch who, who did this, but, you know, there's a new rule uh, in, uh, in college football, the fair catch on a, on a kickoff. And uh, Richmond attempted an onside kick. They were really trying to, you know, press the issue after scoring that touchdown on the pick six. Onside kick attempt, but it was a pop fly onside kick. And the Virginia up man, uh, fair catch, made a fair catch signal. Richmond kids, of course, are cracking into him, trying to knock the ball away because that's what you do on a, on a you know, a pop fly onside kick. But not seeing the, the fair catch signal, 15-yard penalty from the spot. Uh, and then that sh- created that short field for Virginia. And now let's just say this about Perkins. And, and then I want to talk about Jordan Ellis as well. But Perkins, man, I tell you what, uh, the speed we we saw we saw you know saw it in the spring we saw it in the fall, but it's one thing when the quarterback's wearing a red jersey you know they can't touch him and he can run fast and nobody's touching him, and then in live action like this past Saturday you see that speed, that first touchdown and I thought the play design and execution was interesting too on that play it was third and ten from the thirty six yard line and. Uh, Shotgun snap. I think all all the snaps were shotgun snaps in this game. I don't think I saw one under center snap for Virginia in this game. Shotgun snap. He drops back to pass, and then it was a delayed quarterback draw, and the two running backs who were flanking him, sort of serving as protectors, you know, back in the backfield, they, they ran up into the into the hole and and took those second level guys out. And as soon as that happened, it was a touchdown. He was at the 30 yard line, but there was nobody behind that play. And the, that's another thing now that opponents going to have to, 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 to you know, plan for is even when he drops back, you've got to, you still got to be on the lookout for him to take off. The second touchdown that Perkins scored at 22-yard run, another interesting play design and execution. You know, I talked about the triple option, and we saw some triple options involving Jordan Ellis, but one triple option they did in this 22-yard touchdown was, was the play. Ellis was actually used as a decoy uh, as sort of the, the, the fullback. Uh, he was the fake fullback, you know, dive play. And then when Perkins faked that, he goes to his left, and they had Zacchaeus coming around the left end. And so now you're a defense. You have to figure out, do we get the 4-3 guy, Perkins? Do we get the 4-3-2 guy, uh, Zacchaeus? Which one do we pick up? Because either way we go, we got the ball, the man with the ball in his hand or the pitch man. And, and they're both super speedy, so you know that's another one that the opponent, uh, opposing defensive coordinator is going to have a hard time adjusting for when Zacchaeus is is, is going to be a threat with Perkins a threat with Ellis the big back a threat Tavares Kelly uh, they they ran a couple of plays for him they tried to throw a, a, a post pattern for him early in the game and 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 the, actually the pass was just underthrown he had his man beat by a couple of steps. Speed, speed on this team, offensively, defensively as well, but the speed on offense is the big difference maker, I think, for this Virginia team. It's something we haven't seen in a long time, the speed and skill position that Virginia has this year. You can't, the old thing is you can't touch speed, you can't touch height, and speed speed definitely tends to change things up defensively, and you're right. I mean, uh, now, again, don't want to keep beating a dead horse, but this is not Richmond's not an ACC channel for Dana in Indiana, but maybe, you know, the, the, the run you talked about a person, maybe that doesn't go for a touchdown against some of the other ACC teams. I don't have to, because by the time you would have thought, you know, what at that again, too. Um, you know, there was a couple of defenders in here, but they weren't in the area until Bryce was at least 10, 11 yards across the line of scrimmage. Now, we'll take a 10 or 11 yard gain in that pitch way to every single play. Doesn't always have to end in a, in a, in a score. Uh, I think that was, what, a 35 yard run, maybe? 36 yard run, yeah. 36. So, uh, you know, pick up the first down, keep the chains moving. That's something we haven't seen with UVA football in a long time and it was it was really nice to uh, to see that facet of our game that we haven't seen in football, Virginia football for way too long. And really and, and I talked about this last week, Scott, when we were we were doing our preview podcast, that it seemed to me, you know, without seeing it in action yet, now we've seen it in action, that Perkins and what he can do with his feet at quarterback on those option plays 
and, and the Wildcat plays, which we did, I didn't expect to see the Wildcat like we saw. Seven of his ten runs. He had 12 official carries, but they count sacks as runs in college football. So of his ten runs, seven of them either went for a first down or a touchdown. That tell, that's kind of like you're talking about there. He can extend drives with his feet. But Jordan, I expected that Jordan Ellis would have more running room because of the fact that defenses will have to pay much more attention to Perkins, as and more so than they did to, to Binkert. And we see Ellis have a career day. He had 141 yards rushing on 18 carries, averaging almost eight yards per carry. And uh, and so that opened the game up for Ellis as well. Now, I've got a question for you, Scott. Uh, you, you noted this on the live blog. I was late getting to things. Uh, I know the game started late because of weather delays. Uh, I was broadcasting VMI soccer. We had three hours of weather delays, so I actually didn't only got to watch like the last few minutes of the fourth quarter live. But I saw that Brennan Armstrong came in as the backup quarterback, and he was not listed as number two on the depth chart. Lindell Stone had been listed number two. Uh, but Armstrong jumps him, uh, gets the snaps late in the game with the big lead. Uh, what was the scuttlebutt about that in terms of, does this mean, I mean, I guess, is he now the number two guy? And I will say this, listening to the broadcast, watching the broadcast, uh, the, the, the TV announcers, uh, were, were, you know, high in praise of Armstrong, a four-star recruit at a high school. So I guess maybe this is the, the sense that he has climbed the ladder, but what was the sense of the, in, in the press box after the game about Armstrong getting the snaps late in the game? And he looked like he had a good arm. He had good punch. But you got to remember, the game was done. It was certainly mop up time. So we don't even want to even keep that track uh, at that point of how deep Richmond had started something, too. Um, but nonetheless, he still looked, he still made the most of his opportunity. There wasn't really anything said regarding that. My, I, I didn't take that note on the blog. And I also kind of thought, well, maybe. Maybe Mendenhall is being conservative, that if Lindell Stone is your true backup, um, and if he's the guy that you're going to go to when you have to instead of when you want to, then maybe you don't put him out there uh, in harm's way in mop-up time uh, with a second-team line, a third-team line, uh, facing guys across the line that are out there basically kamikaze pilots trying to make a name for themselves. You know, a lot of injuries talk about it in basketball, getting a guy out of the game um, when the game's obviously been decided. You don't want a superstar out there playing with walk-on. Um, not, you know, not implying that Lindell Stone is a superstar, but I'm, I'm just thinking that maybe that wasn't the opportunity to get Lindell Stone um, Plenty of times. Maybe that was an opportunity to get the third string guy out there. Maybe even put your knee on. <laughs> I'll say this. I think maybe you know, Armstrong actually might be a better fit as, as the backup. Stone is a guy that was a holdover. He'd been recruited for, for a couple of years by Mike London staff. He, you know, the, uh, the Mendenhall group stayed with him mainly because of, I mean, you know, I don't know if this is the case, but maybe lack of depth uh, at that at that uh, slot. And Armstrong's a dual threat guy, so perhaps it was an issue of of Armstrong fitting better uh, in in that uh, in that role. And um, let's see here, I think I'm losing Scott, so let's see if we can get him back real quick. But uh, I really think that Armstrong maybe fits better uh, as that backup, and perhaps perhaps that was that. I, it, it'll be interesting to hear. You know, or, or see, you know, and hopefully we won't necessarily see uh, the need for a backup in the coming next couple of weeks, at least with the with the games there. So yeah, Armstrong might fit better uh, as as that backup, and you know, it'll be interesting to see. Now, Scott, I want to get your impressions of the UVA defense because I, I I'll admit when I was watching the replay, I focused more on the offense. The defense, uh, you know, was a question mark going in. What were your thoughts about the UVA defense? I thought they were solid. You know, they they. They had a lot of third down opportunities that they came up strong in. Uh, you didn't see many blown, uh, blown pass re- uh, coverages. Uh, I was actually a little more impressed with with the defense than I was the offense because I think the offense 
got to take into consideration. You know, they weren't they weren't Richmond is a you know not not going to be one of your stronger defense teams that this that UVA is going to face this year. But just those little plays in the trenches, I think they stopped a lot of holes. wasn't wasn't a lot of big bulky runs up the middle. Um, I, I think the defense is going to be um, you know really out for Virginia this season, especially as the season progresses. And as long as we stay healthy, because I'm not certain yet of the depth, and, and, and that's something that's probably going to take another year or two to really start uh, stockpiling that depth. You know, in this, uh, looking at the stats, I've got the stats up. Uh, Richmond, 203 total yards, 2 of 10 on third down. Scott, as you noted, the Virginia defense did a great job on third down. You know, we talked last week in our preview that perhaps Richmond would try to run, establish to run early in this game. 20 carries, 16 yards. Now, some of that was sack yardage lost, uh, actually only 12 yards lost on sack. So, 17, you know, in NFL terms, 17 carries, 28 yards rushing. So, not able to get the running game going, uh, Richmond, in that one. Uh, and that was a concern because Virginia's weak point, you know, the strong point, linebacker and secondary. Weak point defensive line, the lack of depth on defensive line, but Richmond not able to get anything going in the running game. And I'll, I'll point out something, Scott, that came up, you know, because I was late getting to watch the game, uh, I listened to a lot of the game uh, on my drive back from VMI, and Dave Kane made a point. He was trying to be delicate with this point, but he talked about how, you know, there's there's, there's maybe more speed now uh, at linebacker than we've had before. Jordan Mack at middle linebacker, Chris Peace at the weak side linebacker, Chris Snowden at the strong linebacker, Malcolm Cook, you know, a, a, basically maybe a converted, you know, uh, a secondary guy who's you know, a small guy adding speed there uh, at linebacker. He talked about how Micah Kaiser, as great as he was, maybe not the fastest guy. These linebackers fly around the field. You have Bryce Hall at cornerback. At, he actually led the team in tackles in this game. You know, so maybe there's even more speed now than we had last year, even with losing Blanding and losing Micah Kaiser. There might be more speed on this defense now. And, of course, we talked about speed on offense being so key for this Virginia team. Maybe the more speed you're seeing on the field, that's another Bronco Mendenhall staple. He want, he actually he actually likes putting an undersized linebacker, hybrid safety kind of guy out there. Juan Thornhill plays that role a lot. A guy who played you know, cornerback now is playing strong safety but sneaks up into the box an awful lot. More speed just means, you know, that's, yeah, that's that's opportunities to make more stops, I guess, and, and it seemed to it seemed to really work well. They were really flying around a lot on Saturday. Oh, definitely, and and it's spread out. You know, it, it's not isolated speed in one position. You could just see that as the you know, from our from our perch in the press box, pretty sweet view. You can see the whole field. You got a good you got good line of sight, and you can see the the play as it develops. And yeah, their speed, their speed there uh, just mixed in all over the field. And, you know, that, again, may not be um, the most talented players, but speed does have a way of making up for some inadequacy. So. Yes. Speed really does. Uh, speed, you know, you, uh, Scott said it earlier. You can't teach speed. You, you know, you can't. Uh, you know, you can't. You can't. And, and, and a lot of successful college football teams of recent vintage, Miami teams, the Jimmy Johnson era, really, that dates back twenty plus years, twenty five plus years, maybe thirty years now. Jimmy Johnson really revolutionized, especially the defensive side of the ball back in his in his Miami days, uh, with emphasizing speed over size. Al Groh liked size over speed, and you know his teams were effective too, but. You know, the best college defenses in the last maybe 25 years have been those that emphasize the speed. So uh, that's what we're seeing here out of uh, out of this Virginia team early on. So Scott and I will get back together on Thursday or Friday of this week, uh, and we'll focus more on Indiana as uh, we, you know, change from week one to week two. There's a lot to look there. Indiana, uh, a 38-28 win. I think it was at Florida International this past week. I mentioned the six and a half point favorites going into this game. So uh, we'll get ready for that though, uh, in uh, you know later this week, and, and we'll get y'all ready for that. But this breaks up, this breaks down. I should say the the Virginia win over Richmond. And uh, for more on coverage, 
Oh, sure. Sure. And, and this will end the broadcast maybe a positive note, optimistic note. So, you know, wait until, until last night until all the true first game opening day games were completed. And was Virginia Tech win last night over Florida State. I've got a, and I don't know how many games you were able to watch because you were on another time and on Saturday. So I was able to watch quite a few. Saturday, even beginning Thursday night, I think Wake may have played a game to open up early. Um, I don't see a lot of real intimidating teams in the ACC. Um, Clemson, we got to, you know, just kind of eliminate them because we know Clemson is and what Clemson's a national power. They play Furman, so you can't really gauge that. But we're just going to give them a free pass and say we know Clemson's going to be a national championship a level team. But the rest of the team, uh, Florida State, NC State struggled against JMU. Uh, the rest of the team, North Carolina, of course, is expected to be weak, but they are. Um, there, there's not, there's, I don't think that there's some, a lot of what I would call unbeatable teams out there. Uh, Virginia Tech did beat Miami at Florida State last night pretty handily, but was far from a flawless game, and Florida State just looked terrible. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think the big winner of the weekend was Virginia Tech, but we don't know if that's a sign of how good they are or maybe how weak Florida State is in the first game of the Willie Taggart era. Florida State didn't score a touchdown first time, it, 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 not scoring a touchdown at home in over a decade uh, against a Virginia Tech defense that had, re- had replaced a lot from last year. You know, they played four true freshmen uh, in their two deep at cornerback, two sophomores who hadn't played last year at cornerback, and Florida State couldn't throw the ball against them. Uh, so we'll see what that one means later on. But last night, they, you know, Virginia Tech looked pretty good. Uh, but, yeah, you're and, and actually Miami, the blowout while they suffered LSU, all of a sudden we're only one week in, and the Coastal Division's turned upside down because Miami was a preseason favorite, a prohibitive preseason favorite from the writer's perspective. And now – you know, they lost big. Virginia Tech won big. Uh, Florida State had been expected to maybe at least give Clemson something of a run over in the Atlantic Division. Not the case. They got blown out at home, could only score three points. Uh, you mentioned NC State struggling with, with JMU. They, they kind of escaped that one. JMU had to kick two field goals from the two-yard line uh, in, in that loss. Uh, they easily could have won that game. So, uh, so yeah, I think I agree with you, Scott, that uh, – you know, the ACC maybe not – well, I don't want to say it's not as deep, but right for, for, for one week, uh, you know, you know, Virginia maybe is a, is a winner here too. I know, like we said, that, you know, Richmond is not the Richmond of past. They're an FCS team either way. But Virginia, I think, looked pretty good. Virginia is right now as good as anybody, uh, you know, at least on the coastal side, outside of Virginia Tech, I would say. Virginia Tech, I think, is the, is the team that right now you have to put on top of the perch. But I think – the other six teams, you can't say there's anybody that stands out above anybody else, and Virginia's in that mix. So after one week, I think that's an interesting place to be in. Stay healthy, and you can maybe win some games this year. Absolutely. Hey, we have optimism. That's all we can ask for. Optimism, that's right. When's, when's the last time we started the season with optimism? And after one week, continue to have optimism. So uh, that's where we are right now. And if you're a Virginia football fan, that's all you can ask for. So. Uh, Scott and I will get together on Thursday. We'll talk uh, Indiana, Virginia. Get you ready for that one, and uh, we'll, we'll you know see what else pops up as well. But uh, for Scott German, I'm Chris Graham signing off. Wahoo! Wah.